Now that we've seen the Italian operatic transition, it's time to turn our attention to the Germanic style of late 19th century opera. In doing so, we'll look at uh, the works of one composer in particular, Richard Wagner. Now, Wagner is not solely a composer of music. He also writes about music. He writes philosophy about music and the arts. He's also a theorist and a conductor and all around control freak. And we'll see that coming up. Um, his master work is a collection of four operas known as The Ring of the Nibelung. And this collection is a series of four operas meant to be seen four nights in a row totaling almost 20 hours um, in total audience time. Now, his overriding philosophy was one in which every aspect of the arts was working in unison. So it's not merely the music, but the music, the poetry, the stagecraft, the acting, all of which work together. And he called this philosophy Gesamt Kunstwerk, or total work of art, every aspect leading together. So this philosophy was sort of an overarching um, philosophy that was important in Wagner as he wrote and created these works. He was influenced by and influential on a number of important 19th century philosophers, including Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, names that you might have heard of or you may not. Uh, Schopenhauer had a very pessimistic, very negative view of the world, and this appealed to Wagner, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But Schopenhauer's idealization of music as the ultimate art very much appealed to Wagner and was mostly what attracted Wagner to Schopenhauer's writings. Now, Wagner lived uh, throughout Europe and worked for for many different influential opera companies, including the Dresden Opera, for which he worked over the course of six years in the 1840s. He eventually had to leave, however, once, he, once an arrest warrant was issued in his name. There was a large movement and push um, towards revolution in 1848 and 1849, thus forcing Wagner to leave the city after he was sought. For his arrest. Um, he eventually moved to Switzerland and then eventually came back to Germany. He found a rich patron who helped to not only pay off his debts but also to support his artwork going forward. This patron, his name was King Ludwig of Bavaria. Now, King Ludwig, no relation to your fearless leader, um, myself. Um, this patron was known as the Mad King Ludwig, and you might be familiar with some of his um, houses. In fact, his castles up in the mountaintops were what inspired Disney to build the castle at the heart of Disney World down in Florida. So um, Mad King Ludwig was very influential in helping settle Wagner down. He had been a sort of itinerant opera composer moving throughout Europe, and now once he found the support of King Ludwig, he was able to settle down and create a sort of foundation. Uh, this centered around an actual theater in the town of Bayreuth. This theater was built and designed for Wagner specifically, and to this day still exists, and an opera festival for Wagner still runs to this day. Now, the the festival itself is known, the building is known as the Bayreuth Festspielhaus, and this was designed specifically to accommodate the new and unusual style of Wagner's music. We will talk about that more in a minute. Now, the uh, festival to this day has a, an, an incredibly long waiting list, similar to that of the Green Bay Packers season ticket holders list. Before we talk further about the music, we have to take a little tangent into Wagner and his social life. We know and we've mentioned before that Wagner and Franz Liszt were close friends 
and associates. Well, the the line from Franz Liszt to Adolf Hitler is surprisingly short here in the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. So, step one, Cosima van Bülow. She was married to a conductor named Hans van Bülow. Cosima eventually fell in love with Wagner and bore him a daughter. Now, Cosima herself was an illegitimate daughter. She was the product of Marie de Gou, who was Franz Liszt's first lover. So Cosima is Liszt's daughter, eventually falls in love with Wagner. Now, Cosima was raised by Marie and later by the other um, lover in Liszt's life, Caroline Zein Wittgenstein, who we mentioned when we were talking about the painting Liszt at the piano. So Cosima bears Wagner a daughter initially named Isolde and then a son named Siegfried. This son eventually marries a woman 30 years younger than himself named Winifred. Now Siegfried is in a loveless marriage, a loveless marriage with 30 years separating Siegfried from Winifred and Winifred eventually befriends a young Adolf Hitler, eventually writing him notes and diary entries on paper that eventually became the paper on which Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, his famous philosophical treaty. So there you have it, Franz Liszt to Adolf Hitler in about three generations. It's kind of spooky. Now, as we go forward, we have to talk a little bit about the ring, and this four opera cycle. I've got here on the right the collection of operas. Number one is Das Rheingold, number two is Die Valkyra, number three is Siegfried, and the final opera, number four, is Guter Dameron, The Fall of the Gods. So when we're looking at these works, and we will be looking at a small segment of these works, not all 20 hours, we have to remember that concept of total artwork, this idea that the poetry and the music and the stagecraft all play in together in furthering Wagner's philosophical point of view. Now this point of view is grounded in a contrast with the Italian style of opera, which we've seen before. In fact, Wagner was very clear, music drama, what he called his operas, was not opera itself. Music drama was an elevated style of this music drama. So there are a number of arguments in that favor, but the, the clearest and the most important for our purposes is Wagner's development of the use of the light motif. Now we've talked about this a little bit in examples, the Berlioz Symphony Fantastique, the idea of the idée fixe, the fixed idea that represents a character. This is the same idea with the light motif. The light motif is a unifying factor in this opera. So if a character walks on stage, his or her leitmotif will play in the orchestra, thereby helping the audience to remember who that character was. Remember, these operas are four to five hours long a night, and you might need a little help listening to the work. Now, this leitmotif can also add a layer of depth. It not only represents characters and objects, swords or staffs or trees, but it can also represent emotions or memory. So if a character is in love with another character, the love theme could play while he is on stage, making you think as an audience that the, that person is thinking of someone else. So it l adds this layer, this depth, sort of like a hashtag on Twitter. It allows you to let someone know what you're thinking about, even if it's not that clear. Now, in addition to the leitmotif, one other factor that we need to talk about is the style of the music itself. This music is not set up like the typical operas we're used to. No longer do we have recitatives and arias. We have a more continuous flow or stream of music. And the important melodies don't solely res reside in the voice of the singer. 
the orchestra and the singer are equal partners in this new style of music. The orchestra can function almost like a Greek chorus, commenting on the action that's taking place on stage, playing those light motifs that add that layer, that depth. So it's another thing to listen for as we're, we're actually listening to the music itself. The orchestra and the singers are equal partners, something to keep in mind.